The River Between Us, Chapter 11, by Richard Peck, read for you by Mrs. Shoemaker. We made a bare beginning that first afternoon. The doctor watered the boys and said that the measles cases could handle fried chicken. They were easy to locate because of the scabs. I'll say this for Delphine. Once she turned back her sleeves, she went to work. She'd never worked that hard before, and I can witness that she never worked that hard again. But when she set her mind to something, or lapsed into French, you just as well get out of her road. She left Noah to me, and I wondered if it was modesty. I had to get him out of that underwear he had on. That suit of underwear could just about stand up by itself. Delphine gave Noah a wide berth and ministered to the others. When we had to leave, I turned away to give her a moment with him if she wanted it. He wasn't clean enough to kiss, not to mention the witnesses. But she didn't tarry, so I couldn't tell if she loved my brother or not. She drew down her veils and we slogged out of the tent. I'd have thrown my boots away if I'd have had another pair. On our way back to the summer kitchen, I wouldn't have minded riding up beside Dr. Hutchins for the pleasure of his company, but I made sure Delphine rode up there beside him instead. He needed a little starch in his spine, and she was the one to put it there. Sure enough, she lectured him at length about the passes we'd need every day now. There was a nip in the evening air, so she spoke out about blankets for the boys, and we didn't have enough quilts, enough for all. And when the doctor said he lacked the authority to requisition blank blankets, Delphine told him to find the authority double quick, and she didn't want to have to mention it again. She'd been shook by what she'd seen of an army hospital, and instead of calling for her smelling salts, she got her dander up. I was just behind them in the trap, taking in every word. Seemed to me that when it came time to marry, Dr. Hutchins would need a wife with a lighter touch than Delphine's. He looked pretty well whipsawed when he lifted us down at the back of Mrs. Hanoran's place. We lived in her summer kitchen throughout our time in Cairo. The widow Hanoran wanted seven dollars a week from us, and she wanted it up front. She sent her handyman down to collect our rent that first evening. Seven dollars! There were houses all over Grand Tower you could buy outright for seven dollars. And they'd throw in the fencing and dig you a well. But then Mrs. Hanoran was a rich woman, and the rich didn't get that way by giving you a bargain. As we kept being told, we were lucky to have a roof over us. I, for one, had never lived in such luxury as the summer kitchen, had all the city conveniences. The pump was just to one side of the porch, and the privy just to the rear. The big iron stove inside heated water for our laundry and washing ourselves. It took the chill off the evenings, and I was to fry up a deal of chicken through many a night once we got Doc Hutchins to requisition the chickens and the stove wood. The beds were draped with mosquito bars, and were comfortable enough if you were as tired every night as we were, and beneath them a chamber pot apiece, china ones. I was more dead than alive when we got back that first night, but Delphine had to unpack all her dresses and shake them out and hang them around the room. She had brought her gold hand mirror with the violets on the back and the portrait of her papa in its gilt frame, the yellow-haired Monsieur Jules Duval. She hung him above her cot, for she went nowhere without him. Mrs. Hanoran didn't see fit to pay us a call in our early days there. She was a busy woman, according to Dr. Hutchins. Rich Cairo people and big houses took in sick officers to nurse them. So in addition to Dr. Hutchins, she had three or four ailing officers in her spare rooms. One of them was from U.S. Grant's personal staff. These invalids, lolled in starch sheets, seen to by servants, while the regular soldiers slept on the cold ground in their filth. 
But then, if there were justice in the world, you wouldn't look for it in Cairo. And if you ask me, some of them officers were none too poorly. They sat out on the gallery of an evening, smoking their El Sol cigars and drinking from small silver cups. And I doubt if it was medicine. Our days at Camp Defiance overlapped in my mind. But each day Noah was stronger, tottering, then helping out, then growing restless. We wanted to get them all on their feet, at least well enough to carry their own slops and feed themselves. We only lost one, a boy from up around Belleville, and he was too far gone when we got there. He starved to death because he couldn't keep anything down. Delphine spoiled two of her dresses trying to feed him. You wouldn't have known her. When he died in her arms, she closed his eyes, folded his hands on his poor shrunken chest, and looked away with her mouth pulled into a straight line. I can't tell you more about it. I can't bear to bring it back. Seeing her lovely face floating over them may have pulled several through, but... You couldn't call her an angel of mercy. When some of the boys lacked the spirit to eat or stir themselves, she was apt to say, You will need all your strength when you come against the Confederates. They are a real army. They're really, they rarely sicken and never retreat. So, <laughs> I suppose her greatest achievement was that she wasn't shot as a traitor. And as they improved, they wanted to know our names, especially hers. But I was popular, too, because I was Noah Pruitt's sister. His company, C, was made up mostly of Jackson County boys, and they told us of home, of sisters and sweethearts, and the tears flowed. We got our boys well enough and fed to where they could shovel out the tent down to the dry ground. And that was after we found out where the army hid the shovels. We made a bonfire of the straw they slept on, and once we found fresh straw, I boiled their long-handled underwear over an open fire, and that underwear teemed and swarmed with living things that glistened and crawled. Ugh, I itch to think of it now. No able-bodied loafer outside our tent was safe from us. We had jobs for all, each and all sending them for kindling and straw or whatever they could find. And we put them to work, and anybody not skinning could hold a leg, as the saying went. We got some loafer to fetch, or to find us a bunch of them big nail kegs. You could saw them in two and cock them, and then the boys could take baths in them. Of course, they wouldn't strip naked until the sun sunset gun had seen Delphine and me off the post. We got our boys clean and stretched out on fresh sweet straw. We dosed them with our cures and cooked their rations for them. We made a believer out of Doc Hutchins, and no army doctor came around to put a stop to us. We sang some, too, because the, bo because the boys liked it. Delphine could offer up a rendition of My Old Kentucky Home flavored in her French that brought a lump to many a Yankee throat including mine, and we sang a song the whole country was singing that fall of 1861, though I mu thought it must have been written expressly for me. Brother, tell me of the battle, how the soldiers fought and fell. Tell me of the weary marches, she who loves will listen well. Brother, draw thee close beside me, Lay your head upon my breast. While you're telling of the battle, let your fevered forehead rest. We slept fast and deep through the brief nights, and hardly had the time to look up for days, or to notice that we weren't girls any more. All around us the camp girded for war on the river. Black Jack Logan, who commanded the 31st, spoke of hewing their way to the gulf with their swords, 
and Colonel White came to our tent to see who was fit enough to train, and took Noah away. Back he cobbled in a pair of stiff new boots, carrying an ancient Belgian musket he said hadn't been fired since Napoleon's day, and the sabers rattled around us. The Confederate general, Leonidas Polk, held the Mississippi not twenty miles south of Cairo. His rebs were dug in both sides of the river at Columbus, Kentucky, and the steamboat landing at Belmont, Missouri. U.S. Grant was expected to move down river and make a demonstration against the rebs' position any minute now. Then, one day, they issued Noah his full uniform. It was so shoddy that Delphine said it would melt in the first rain. And it was so big on him he looked like a little ear of corn with too many husks. But he was ready to fight now, and I braced myself for the attack. It came quicker than I thought, quicker than a striking snake when you least look for it. And that attack came not from the camp, nor on the river. It came to the summer kitchen. <laughs>